The gruesome and mysterious death of the Isdal woman. November 29, 1970. About 12 and a half miles east of Bergen, Norway. A father and his two young daughters, aged 10 and 12, are enjoying a day outdoors, hiking a trail at Isdalen. The hiking trails of Isdalen are popular and largely family friendly. They showcase the mountainous wilderness of Norway. Though many hikers have gotten themselves into trouble by venturing down paths that lead to harsher conditions. Part way into the young family's hike, they smell a strange odor. It smelled like something burning, but it didn't smell like someone started a fire to stay warm or to cook. This smell was different. The smell hung in the air and they followed it. They followed the odor to some rocks nearby, and to their absolute horror, they saw a woman's body. It was so badly burned it was difficult to tell. The man and his young daughters ran. There was no way to know if this was some kind of horrible accident, or if there was a killer in the woods. They needed to tell the authorities. That meant they had to hike all the way back to the city to inform police of their gruesome discovery at Isdalen. The name Isdalen is Norwegian for Ice Valley. It is known to locals as Death Valley. In medieval times it was a site where people committed suicide. Some hikers have even fallen to their death while hiking in the fog. One of the first investigators on the scene was Carl Pulveros. The first thing he encountered was the pungent and unmistakable smell of burning flesh. The body was off of the hiking path and situated between large rocks. It was difficult to get near it and could have easily been missed if not for the distinctive and overbearing smell saturating the air. What he encountered that day, he would not soon forget. The body was burned all over the front including the face and hair. Strangely, it was not burnt on the back. She was so badly burned, it was impossible to see what she actually looked like. As other investigators began to arrive, they noticed that she looked as if she had thrown herself back away from the fire. Had something in the fire suddenly exploded, causing her to fall backwards? Then maybe she hit her head, but her clothes caught fire and she never woke up. As investigators began their work, they discovered their first pieces of evidence. Charred fragments of an umbrella, clothes, two melted plastic bottles, jewelry, a watch, a pair of rubber boots, some remnants of paper, a half bottle of liquor and a plastic cover possibly for a passport but she did not have any identification then while processing this cache of potential leads they stumble upon a curious detail the clothes that were not destroyed by fire had all of the tags carefully removed then they realized the labels of most of the other objects were also removed. The objects at the scene seemed to lead to more questions than answers. Why was she at Isdal? Why did she have so many personal possessions with her? Why were the labels and tags missing? And where was her ID? After one day of working this case, the Bergen police realized it was not a straightforward matter. They asked for the assistance of Norway's National Criminal Investigation Service. Rolf Harry Jarman was the experienced head of the investigation team. 
he immediately took his team to Bergen. This began a thorough and wide-reaching investigation, which included various departments across Europe. Every available officer was tasked with chasing down leads and following clues. After a week of running down different leads, not a single bit of information panned out. No definitive information was found. It was beginning to seem as if the Isdal woman didn't even exist. Many investigators suspected that she fled from something and made every effort to hide her true identity. No significant information is found for three days. That's when investigators suddenly found two unclaimed suitcases at the Bergen train station. Inside one of the suitcases was a pair of sunglasses. On the lens was a fingerprint and it was a match for the Isdal woman. Also in the suitcases were clothes, several wigs and glasses that had non-prescription lenses. It seemed to investigators that the Isdal woman hid her true identity and shockingly had suitcases with objects meant to change her appearance. Investigators believed that the suitcases and their contents might be the break they needed this might have been a major turning point, and they'd finally be able to positively identify the Isdal woman. Their hopes were quickly dashed when they realized someone had carefully removed the labels from all of the objects, including the comb and the hairbrush. What they found only raised more questions. Inside one of the suitcases was a notebook and a shopping bag. The notebook had what seemed like random numbers and letters written on only the first page. They wondered if it was some sort of code, though they weren't sure as it was unlike anything they'd ever seen. It was studied meticulously for several days. The shopping bag was from a shoe store in Stavanger, which is about four and a half hours south of Bergen. Investigators immediately contact the store and make the trip to question anyone that may have had contact with the unknown woman. When they arrived at the store, they were able to speak with the owner's son. He was just 22 years old. And as luck would have it, he remembered the foreign woman very well. Three weeks before she was found, she was in this store, shopping for rubber boots. The store owner's son explained, she spent considerable time making her decision. Eventually she purchased a pair of extremely popular boots. A model, worn by about half of the female population, of Norway. These were the same boots, found beside the mystery woman's remains, at Isdal. This was the break investigators needed to move the case forward. They could finally get a description of the woman. Up to this point, they didn't know who they were looking for. Given that her remains were destroyed beyond recognition, and she had no ID. The store owner's son said, she was a medium height, with long dark hair, dark brown eyes and a round face. He went on to say, she spoke poor English, and he distinctly remembers she had an odd smell. A smell which, to him was very foreign. Other witnesses questioned by investigators, also mention, the unusual smell. Years later, the vegetable garlic, would become more prevalent in Norway. And the store owner's son, would recognize the smell of garlic, as the odd and unfamiliar smell, he remembered so well. Investigators finally have a description of the woman found at Isdal. They quickly decide, to go to all the hotels in the area. 
They asked the employees if they've seen a woman fitting their description. At the Saints Fit Dunn Hotel, they speak with a front desk clerk. She tells investigators she remembers a woman with dark hair, a round face, and she spoke English poorly. She said that the woman stayed at the hotel for several days and checked in under the name Finella Lorque. And the woman told her that she came from Belgium. Another employee of the hotel said she saw the Belgian woman wearing the same rubber boots the woman bought from the shoe store a few days before. It seemed that some pieces of the puzzle were finally starting to come together. Investigators were confident that Fenella Lorque from Belgium must be the Isdal woman. They believe that she traveled from Stavanger to Bergen and checked in at a hotel there before something happened to her at Isdalen. However, it wasn't long before investigators hit another dead end. As they began checking other hotels and businesses for records of Fenella Lork, they came up empty handed. There didn't seem to be any other evidence of someone by that name. In the 1970s, travelers and guests from other countries had to fill out a form at hotels called alien registration forms. They were required to provide their name, address, passport number, and signature. With very little information to go on, and very few leads, investigators had to make use of the evidence they had. They used the notepad found at the scene, and the alien registration form from the hotel in Stavanger, as handwriting samples. They began combing through handwriting samples, from other hotels, all across Norway. Over the next several days, experts analyzed the handwriting of women from other countries who stayed in Norwegian hotels over the past year. After just a few days, they discovered something quite unexpected. They found several matches. And more importantly, each match was for a different name. The matching handwriting came from multiple hotels from across the country. Apparently, she spent the last few weeks traveling from town to town. The Isdal woman had checked into seven different hotels under seven different names. At the first hotel, she used the name Finella Lork. At the second, she used the name Claudia Tielt. At the third, she was Vera Yarla. Then, Alexia Zarna Merkez. Then Claudia Nielsen. Then Genevieve Lancier. And finally, Elizabeth Leenhaufer. Investigators found that the Isdal woman had stayed at hotels in Oslo, Bergen, Stavanger, and Trondheim. She used a different name at every hotel, but each time claimed to be a citizen of Belgium. When investigators discovered this common thread, they reached out to Belgian authorities. Belgian investigators checked all of the information the Isdal woman provided at the hotels. They quickly learned that every single bit of information was false. The investigation into the mystery woman at Isdal seemed to hit another dead end. Many of the hotel employees have vivid memories of their encounters with the Isdal woman. She was from another country. She was independent and sophisticated. She was confident, but unapproachable and formal. Needless to say, she had many characteristics, which made her stand out from the crowd and be memorable. Interestingly, she didn't seem to express any interest in hiking or spending time outdoors. Investigators had the remains of a woman they were unable to identify. The circumstances of her death were peculiar. They discovered that she was traveling through the country 
using various pseudonyms, and had luggage, with wigs and non-prescription glasses. It appeared as if she was covering her tracks, that she didn't want to be found, or followed, and had the tools and ability to do it. Over the course of the first week of the investigation, the public and the media were speculating as to the true identity of the Isdal woman. How is it possible for someone to have at least seven passports and leave only personal impressions behind? Perhaps a better question is why? It was at this point, unbeknownst to the public, investigators began to suspect that the Isdal woman was a spy. More often than not, in cases of unidentified bodies, investigators make a public appeal, asking if someone might know the person. Perhaps a friend or a loved one has gone missing. Generally, there is a high probability that the unidentified person is a missing person. But in this instance, investigators made no such attempt. The peculiar details of this case caused them to quickly arrive at the conclusion that the Isdal woman was a foreign agent. Instead of reaching out to the public, they reached out to various government agencies for information about a possible spy operating in Norway. The Isdal woman used at least seven different names at hotels and therefore must have had at least seven different legitimate looking passports. She traveled all across Norway which immediately raises the questions, how was she able to get them? And where did she get the money? In the 1970s, due to its proximity to the Soviet Union, Norway was a hub of activity for Russian and Israeli spies. Beginning in the 1960s, the United States, West Germany, and the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment started a collaboration on a new kind of anti-ship missile. It was called, the Penguin. It was the first NATO anti-ship missile, to use an infrared seeker, instead of an active radar seeker. The Penguin, could be launched from missile boats, fighter aircraft, and helicopters. Norwegian technology company, Kongsberg Gruppen, aided in the development, of the software and hardware. The Kongsberg Group were a major industrial company based in Kongsberg, Norway. They produced everyday necessities and contributed to the development of the defense and maritime industries. After World War II, they created the Defense Research Establishment, which focused on high-tech defense manufacturing and development to meet the needs of the Norwegian military and NATO. As the Penguin missile was being developed and tested, the Soviet Union wanted to know more. The USSR was isolated, but had a vast network of spies and assets at their disposal, which they used to keep tabs on not only potential enemies from within, but also the social, political and military activities of other major Western countries. Gathering intelligence of weapons systems was a major priority. They wanted to understand the latest technology, not just to copy it and defend it, but also to sabotage it. Development and testing of the Penguin was of significant interest to the Soviet Union. Spies posing as various legitimate parties constantly attempted to gain information on the program. On December 22, 1970, the Norwegian Navy reported to Norwegian counterintelligence that over the past several months, an unknown woman, of average height, long dark hair, and a round face, was seen on multiple occasions, observing penguin tests at the naval base, in Stavanger. And the same woman was seen, multiple times, at tests in Bergen. The military thought her presence was suspicious, and were concerned about her intent. During Penguin missile tests, members of the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment were present and many stayed at hotels. The security of their rooms became a major concern. Access to the personnel or their rooms would have been simple. 
and a favorite tool in the field of espionage, was bugging private quarters. As investigators made contact with numerous intelligence agencies, they had something of a breakthrough. They discovered the seemingly incoherent writing on the Isdal woman's notepad, was in fact, a code. A code they were finally able, to crack. It is a coded record of her travels throughout Norway. The hotel forms show the dates she was in Oslo, Bergen, Stavanger, and Trondheim. For example, N9N, 18S, means she was in Stavanger, from November 9th to November 18th. Based on this code, investigators now knew that she traveled from Paris to Stavanger, then to Bergen, then to Trondheim, then back to Stavanger, and finally, back to Bergen. Cracking the code would show where the Isdal woman had been. But it didn't tell them why. And it certainly didn't tell them who she was. The hope was that after learning of her extensive travels, a clearer picture would emerge. But it simply raised more questions. Likewise, Interpol, and various intelligence agencies all over the world, reported back to investigators in Norway, that the names and passport numbers used by the Isdal woman, were unknown. And, there was no one matching her description, reported missing, anywhere. One of the few methods of identification investigators had left, was forensic odontology. Forensic odontology is the examination, and evaluation, of dental evidence in criminal justice cases. Teeth are one of the hardest substances in the human body. They can resist chemicals, fire, or other substances, that deteriorate and damage the human body. The Isdal woman had 10 crowns on her teeth, that were made of gold. The forensic odontologist, that examined the Isdal woman's teeth, noted in the official report, that this kind of crown was not in use in Scandinavia. And they were of a very distinct character and design, which was in use in the Orient, and in some parts of Southern and Central Europe. After thoroughly examining her teeth, investigators were unable to determine a specific region of origin, and were unable to retrieve any further information as to her identity. They speculated two other possible theories about who the Isdal woman was. One such idea was that she was a sex worker. That might explain her extensive travel and frequenting of several hotels. It might even explain why she used fake names. However, there was no significant evidence to support this idea. The other theory is that she was not a spy herself, but a courier for secret intelligence operatives. Eyewitnesses claim to have seen her in various locations speaking with different men. This fact alone may seem to support the sex worker theory, but Soviet intelligence couriers would have multiple identifications and travel extensively to meet contacts. Secret agents on the other hand, would generally maintain a single identity. They'd create and memorize a false history for their false persona. They would not attract attention to themselves in the manner, the independent, and sophisticated, Isdal woman did. Even after considering several logical explanations, they could not find any, absolutely verifiable proof of anything. All they had was bits and pieces of evidence, that didn't add up to a single explanation. And theories of which, they had no proof. To many investigators, it was clear that something criminal and atrocious had occurred. But they didn't know why. Or who was at fault. As the holidays approached, the investigation began to stagnate. Around this time, Investigators received the final results of the autopsy. The findings seemingly answer a few questions, 
but simultaneously cause the mystery, to deepen. The Isdal woman ingested a large amount of sedative, in the hours preceding her death. Many of the pills were not dissolved before she died. That means the pills cannot have been the primary cause of death. However, this would indicate, that she committed suicide. They believed, based on the enormous amount of pills in her system, it would have been almost impossible, for an assailant to force her to take them against her will. The medical examiners concluded, that the cause of death is assumed to be a combination, of poisoning from the sedative phenomal, and carbon monoxide poisoning. Her injuries caused by fire, were likely a contributing factor. An expert from the Norwegian National Police, that attended the autopsy, wrote a report about what was found at the scene including gasoline that was in the soil, underneath the Isdal woman's body. He noted that this explains how she was burned. But it doesn't explain why the fuel was under her, and on her. Given this curious detail, he hesitates to definitively conclude, whether it was a homicide, or an accident. Right before Christmas, criminal commissioner, Oscar Hordness, gives a final press conference at the police headquarters, in Bergen. He explains that although investigators have taken this case as far as they can, it is not solved, and not classified as closed, because the Isdal woman, has not been identified. Just a few days later, S. Buren Breen, the Bergen chief of police, gives his uncomplicated conclusion. After reviewing all of the facts and evidence, he believed she must have been overcome, by some sort of psychosis, and died, by suicide. After the Christmas holiday, resources were pointed elsewhere. The case was essentially concluded. They never learned the Isdal woman's true identity, or why she was actually in Norway. They never found out, why she went to Isdalen. Many of the investigators disagreed with the conclusion. They were convinced, that it was murder. The fact that she had various identities, and used codes. The fact that she wore wigs, traveled from town to town, and checked in and out of multiple hotels. All of these behaviors and practices are the very definition, of conspiratory behavior. They didn't believe that she had simply suffered from a tragic mental episode. And perished by her own hands. They believed the evidence, pointed to something, much more sinister. On February 5th, the unsolved case of the Isdal woman, came to an unofficial close, at the Molendal graveyard in Bergen. Eighteen members of the Bergen police force, attended the funeral, for the unknown woman. A priest spoke in the freezing rain and the Isdal woman's coffin was put in the ground, by six Bergen police investigators. Her final resting place, is unmarked, due to her being unknown. But she was buried in a coffin lined with zinc. Zinc-lined coffins, are resistant to moisture. And if anyone, claiming to know the Isdal woman comes forward, her remains will be in much the same condition, they were laid to rest in. In the decades since, no one has come forward with any information. Then, in 2016, after renewed public interest, Norway's National Criminal Investigation Service, began to look into the mystery, once again. Technology has advanced considerably since 1970. Chemical analysis, of blood tissue and bone, can tell investigators a myriad of crucial details, in this instance, they ran an analysis of strontium isotopes, from the Isdal woman's jaw and teeth. Strontium isotopes, replace some of the calcium in the bone and tooth enamel. By analyzing it, we can see where a person has been. The results show, that she likely moved in early childhood, from Eastern or Central Europe, to the Nuremberg area in Germany. 
possibly, the western region of France. Her move was immediately before, or during World War II. Further analysis shows, she was born in 1930, which makes her a little older than previously believed. Interestingly, the Isdal woman's DNA material taken during the course of the investigation is property of the Norwegian police. And they say that for legal and ethical reasons, they have not put it through commercial databases used by people to find out about their ancestry. However, Interpol was allowed to look at her DNA. Unfortunately, they were unable to match it with anyone in their system. Since she was discovered in the woods of Isdal, many years ago, no definitive answers have been found. We still don't know who she was. Or why she died in such a gruesome way. We don't know why she was in Norway. Why she used fake names and fake passports. Was she on the run from her past? Was she a secret agent whose last mission ended in her demise? Perhaps it's as simple as, she suffered from some sort of tragic mental episode. The questions we are left with, far outweigh the answers. It seems that we may never know, who the Isdal woman, really was.